Afternoon guys, Dr. Ken Nordberg again. <laughs> a snowy below zero day here in Minnesota. And uh, I'm starting to feel much better now. <laughs> you know, ready to get back at these fireside seminars of mine. Now, the last time I talked to you, uh, I explained a lot about why you have to scout. <laughs> you know, with all those changes going on, understanding deer signs, things like that, three different kinds of bucks for the reason that uh, because of what they do and where they are while breeding is going on. And uh, we all have periods during the fall, you know, between uh, early November to the end of the year when breeding is going on. And so what you're learning here now is important for all fall hunting. And uh, even bull hunting before breeding begins. You know, those, that October period, especially the last half of October, what, I, you what you learned last time I talked to you, is applicable to that when you're hunting with with archery equipment. Well, now I want to get to you know half of what I'm talking about here on this particular subject is scouting. We haven't really gotten around to that too much. You know, I taught you what to look for, and gee, we've talked about deer signs in many many of my seminars in the last year and a half, and some of those you might want to go back to and look for the titles that deal with deer signs and, and learn those kind of things because that's the language of buck hunting. You know, the ABCs of buck hunting is deer signs. And the reason it's important is uh, when you, you know, when you're out in the woods and, and you, you jump a buck or you're walking around uh, without direction, just walking, looking, or even during the deer scene. And uh, usually, when you're when you're doing that, when you do see a buck or a, or a lot of other deer, they're running. Yeah, there they go, tails up. Now, did, what did you learn when you saw that with the deer running with his tail up, maybe snorting as it goes? Well, you learn they run away when a hunter gets close, you know. But how does that help your deer hunting? If you're thinking, oh, now I know where to hunt big bucks, because that this is where the big buck was. Well, you know, especially during deer seasons or when you're getting close to deer season, anytime you hunt in a, in a way that makes a lot of deer run or even just one buck run, let's say he raises the tail and there he goes and you get your gun up and you just get a glimpse and that's and it's gone. That buck has gone for a long time. Older buck, you know, if you do that with a yearling, if a yearling runs away, chances are he'll be back later today or tomorrow, almost for sure he'll be back in that area tomorrow. But not a big buck, you know, big bucks get to be big by being particularly good at avoiding hunters. Identifying them when they're still safe distance away and stay out of sight of them. They're the best there is in the woods for doing that. That's why you hardly ever see big bucks. That's how they get to be big bucks. So, but anyway, whenever you make a big buck raise his tail and bound away, generally he's gone for the season. He'll stay out of that area or his entire home range until hunting is over. So you didn't learn anything from that. The way you learn to predict where a big buck is going to be is by understanding his tracks and droppings and other signs like maybe antler ups, ground scrapes, things of that sort. But those are all things that lend to be able to predict where that buck is going to be later today or tomorrow morning. And all bets are off after that because as you've already learned, there's good reasons why that big buck is like a, 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 a cricket out there. You don't know which way he's going to go next. Uh, they move a lot. Uh, just 
before the last couple of weeks before breeding begins and all during the two, first two weeks that breeding is going on in November and then it happens again in December. They are moving a lot. Man. Hardly in any one place for more than 24 to 26 hours on any one day. Now you know all about that. So signs, I will tell you what deer are doing when they're not alarmed. Now that's the kind of signs that help you predict where, you know, if, that, if you find signs of a walking buck, you know, a big four-inch track, and he's walking, and right over there is a feeding area, or let's say a doe, and, a doe and estrus is on his body, you can smell that, that pheromone in the air being produced by that doe, and he's walking over that way, he's smelling a doe over there, and if there happens to be a feeding area over there, and of course, you got to understand feeding areas too. You know how to identify them. But uh, there's a feeding over there, and that that buck is almost certain to be with that doe this evening. Uh, say, say, get to your stand site. Oh, I would get out there about two o'clock at the latest. Get going from camp at by one o'clock and be out there early and sit crosswind on a periphery of that feeding area. Because you don't want to be downwind in the evening because the, the, the buck and any other deer coming to that feeding area, they're going to come from downwind and you're going to be upwind of them and you've lost the game right there. You want to be uh, crosswind by them. But those kind of signs tell you this is where to hunt the buck. And there's lots of signs. We talked about those last time and we're going to talk more about that today. Because today I want to talk about uh, non-breeding bucks, and you know why I want to talk about them, they're the most difficult of bucks to hunt while breeding is in progress because they're not where they usually are. They're hiding from that dominant breeding buck. And once hunting season begins, they might stay out there in these hide hideaways. And I want you to learn how to find those hideaways and how to identify them. And that's important because, you know, you can be 100 feet away from one of those hideaways and not know it's there. I, in fact, one of them I'm going to talk about in this series, because I'm going to talk to you about seven different hideaways, because no two are alike. They're all, they're, in some ways they're very much alike because of where they are and how those non-breeding bucks use them. But in other ways, you can walk through the woods and there can be three of them over there and they all look different and if you don't know what to look for, you're not going to find them. And if you don't know how to scout for them, you're not going to find them. I mean, if you're a guy who only walks in the woods where it's easy to walk, uh, on trails or openings, you know, or clear cuts or whatever, or you only walk where it's easy to walk, you aren't going to find many areas like that. They're, their buck bedding areas, temporary areas, or regular feeding areas for that matter, that bucks like to use because they are hard to find. And if you're just walking trails or where it's easy to walk, you're not going to find many, if any, of those kind of spots. And now you know why it's important to find them. So I want to help you find them. Man. So we're going to talk about seven different kinds of them. And that should pretty much cover what you're going to want to look for in the future while scouting before season or while scouting during the hunting season, which you can do if you do it properly without alarming deer. When I say properly, you don't alarm deer in that time. And what you're looking for is deer science, not deer. You don't need to see a big buck to identify one in the area. All you need is this deer science. And you don't need anything else. Uh, if you know what you're looking for, to, to know, or the, you know, the, the odds will be way up there, really high, where he's going to be later today, or middle of the day for that matter, during this break, or at, uh, at uh, begin tomorrow morning, where he's going to be. And you won't always be right, but you'll be right often enough so that uh, in where you hunt, where there's a lot of deer, you should be able to take a pretty decent buck every year, knowing things like that, or almost every year. So, important, it's really important. And like I said at the beginning last time I talked to you, 
there's a lot of things here that you've never heard of before, that you don't know. I, I don't recall anybody ever teaching me this stuff. I learned it the hard way over a 60-year period of time. And so now I'm passing it on to you. Okay, now I'm ready to start on these, these hideaways. And you know about it. You know, if you're just looking at this, this particular seminar for the first time, quit right now. Go back one. Get my, my last seminar. Watch that. It's hour long. Sit down when you have time. Take notes if you want along the way. But go back to that first. Otherwise, you're going to think, what's going on here with this one? It's important that you see the last one, a seminar I did, when you start this one. Because then what I'm going to talk about today is going to make a lot of sense. Okay. Now, uh, you've seen this map before. You know, different colors and stuff. And I've talked about this particular book before. Now this map is the area, on this map, is the area where I've taken my largest buck in my all the years I've been hunting whitetails, the biggest one. And uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how that worked uh, and why I got that buck, but a little bit here. Now, what I talked about before was the day, the evening. I was heading back to camp. I was walking along the trail. There's a highland here, a big hill. And uh, down here is a big elder swamp, a huge one. And it, down the end of it down here is a cedar swamp. And there's a little creek going through this elder swamp. Now, for years, many years actually, Every time I walk down this trail on the highland, man, that easy to walk there. In fact, this was, part of this was an old logging trail, so it was kind of a nice easy walk along the edge of that mixed timber highland over here. There was always ground scrapes and antler rumps along that trail. And what got me, this, the year I got that buck, I was coming back along that, and there was one there about there, and really freshly renewed, you know, it was snow all over the ground, and this thing was pawed out freshly because black dirt scattered all over the snow way over there, and uh, so, you know, this it snowed not long before that was done, so this was pretty fresh. And then the, there was evergreen tree right next to it, and the, and the branches on the evergreen tree were mangled, you know, overhanging that ground strip. And there was pieces of the evergreen laying on the, on, the, on the scrape on the ground. And I looked at that, oh man, that's a big dominant box ground scrape antler up here. Uh, I, uh, I would sure like to see this buck. And I remember coming along, and here I come to a second one, and I stopped again. And this was a kind of a steep-sided hill here, and I was up pretty high. And I stopped to look at that, and then beyond that, down there, and it was getting dark, and you know, it was kind of dark, getting dark down there. And I saw something that looked like a buck standing there with big antlers. Yeah, that's, oh, that's a dead. Got my gun up to look at it through the scope. And I'll be damned it was, but the minute I got my gun up, boy, he bounded off into this elder swamp. And that was the thing that bothered me about this big elder swamp. I would find a trail here and there, not very many of them, going off into the elder swamp. And they didn't, the tracks I found on those didn't match up with this kind of a buck. And, but when I saw this one down there, it looked pretty darn big. And, I, you know, I've been telling you how some of these non-breeding bucks that disappear while breeding is going on are, can be very big. They can be as big as the biggest buck in the country, in the square mile surrounding the area. But the only thing that they don't have is aggressiveness. 
to match the biggest buck. Uh, and the biggest buck could be just a mean son of a gun and, and uh, a lot meaner than the other one and if they can be evenly matched otherwise, but that meaner one is going to win and he's going to be the top dog of this square lamp. But I didn't know. I didn't know if I was looking at that buck, the dominant green buck, or any other. So anyway, but this darn swap was always, it always stopped me because full of elders, 10 feet tall, interlacing, and puddles of water all over the place, and there a little creek running through there. And, little, and pulls water all over the place, and it's not the kind of place where, where a hunter normally goes. But this, this swamp taught me, you better start learning how to hunt bucks living in awful places like that, because those are ideal spots for bucks to get away from not only the big, ferocious, odd-dominant breeding bucks, while well, breeding is in progress, or even, you know, the two weeks before that, stay away from that buck, but it's a darn good place for them to stay away from humans because it might, in the beginning they may go out there because they want to stay away from the big dominant breeding buck, but once hunting starts, that's a perfect place for them to be because humans don't go out there either. You know, they can go out here and live for months and never hear a human sloshing around in those elders surrounding uh, it's a little island. You had a little island out here. It was kind of a little knob out in the swamp. And I've only been at that knob once in my life because I just wanted to see it once. I went out there during one scouting preseason one time. And, oh, no wonder they like to live out here. Or this buck did. Anyway, so uh, the following morning I went back down in there and got on the trail, went over here and sat on a log in the swamp. and. And, well, I sat up here to start with watching this edge and the cedar swamp behind me, and that's full of water, too. And, and I heard ice breaking, and I thought, well, geez, it's got to be a, a big deer. It's got to be a deer or a or a, uh, a moose making that much right. Boy, that ice was breaking. It was really long, and it was snowing it was fairly heavy at times. And I, so I decided I got to get down close. I got to get down in the swamp in the direction that I heard the ice breaking. And I got down and I was sitting on that log and, and it wasn't long after it was getting light and I saw this object that looked like a big deer stand or the great big antlers right in front of me right here. And But it didn't move. I looked at it, looked at it, looked at his broadside. The head was looking over this way. And finally I said, it can't be a deer. It just, you know, brush and things come together at a certain point, it looks like a deer there. So I, then I quit looking at it and I was checking other areas, I was being careful not to move rapidly because I knew something big was out here. And I, finally I turned and looked back and that object that looked like a deer wasn't there anymore. I said, oh, it was a deer. And then I, I kept looking and there was moving off and away from me on the right, but I couldn't, I was, had my gun up looking, but geez, all kinds of brush and I kept moving and I just couldn't see a clear opening, so I'd make a shot and then finally it turned and started down this direction. I got in that area and I fired and I hit it and my bullet went through a small ash tree before it hit the deer and the bullet five minutes and it hit the deer in five places and it ran off. That's another story, but I got it. I did it. I finally got it uh, and I finished. It was still alive when I finally caught up to it. One more shot put it down and that, and that was it. But my biggest book ever. Now, here's the point I want to make. A lot of places that big bucks, and that's smart, boy, how huh? If I was a big buck living in this area and things were hunting me, oh man, that's where I'd want to live, you know, spend my time because humans just don't go wandering off through elder swamps just for the fun of it or for any reason, you know. And so, perfect spot. In this case, though, you only, you know, you just don't have any chance of hunting. 
let's see you a guy. So I, you know, I'm gonna sleep late. I, I always do better in the afternoon or at noon or whatever you want to say. That was when I get my deer, because that's when you hunt them. You know, if you don't hunt early in the morning, you don't get any in the, early in the morning. But I'm an early morning hunter, and I like to be an early morning hunter because really big bucks are active then, moving around, feeding, or with does and heat, or, you know. That, that's their, one of their most active times. And even if they are being really cautious, and even if they decide, like some bucks do, I'm not going out there in the daytime anymore. I'm going to stay right in my bed in the daytime because there's hunters out there. And then they come at you from every direction. I don't want to be out there, so I'm only going to move in at night. But even when they only do that, in early morning, they don't see, decide it's night now, and it's time for me to go back to my bedding area until eight, maybe nine o'clock. Still, you know, finally the sun's coming up, it's long shadows in the woods in the morning, finally it gets a fire, and then it's all sunny and bright. Well, they aren't around then anymore, they're gone. So, early morning is when I've taken most mature bucks in my lifetime. That's because I, I'm an early morning hunter, so that's when I'm going to see most of my deer. But it's, I, it's, it was such a good thing. All my sons, my three sons, also became early morning hunters because dad always gets them then, and then they started getting them then. And we were doing so good at getting them, and that everybody else decided that in, in our, my first study or that the Nordbergs got all the big bucks. All the big bucks live where they hunt. <laughs> And then they started, then it was it's public land, they just said, wow, we got as much right to hunt those as he does, and even though we've been hunting there for many, many, many uh, decades, you know, in the old days, that people didn't do that sort of thing, but they started making drives right behind my tent, and finally we had to get out of there. But anyway, so we became, but one of the things we learned to do, you know, Beginning of the hunting season, we would be out in the highlands here, you know, that, that's where we usually hunted. Easy there to get around, we didn't have to go through big swamps, cedar, elder swamps, cedar swamps, cattail swamps, anything like that. We hunted in the highlands and we did pretty well there and we'd hunt big bucks. We were hunting big bucks while breeding was in progress and we got to be pretty good at reading deer signs and using deer signs when they're not Alarmed, they're not alarmed deer, are just running away. They're alarmed, they're unalarmed deer, and their tracks are showing us what they're doing right now, or did maybe a couple hours ago. Just fresh times, not old deer sign, fresh. This is what they're doing now, this is where they are right now, this is why they're here right now, and there's a feeding area that's going to be really important later today or tomorrow morning. So, one of those times we're liable to get that buck, well, it might take three, four, five, maybe eight days later when we make a decision like that and it finally works and there's a big buck with a doe right out there. And they walk up 30 yards away and you get the buck and it's almost too easy. And, but that's how you get shots like that, by this kind of hunting, using signs to tell you where to go. So, anyway. This one, you had to be almost lucky because there were trails around here and this guy would apparently come out close to, maybe because of those in this area and, uh, and or this dominant breeding buck. I finally decided this had to be a lesser buck because uh, a week later there were still some of these antler of the ground scrapes that were being renewed again. That's, and in big tracks, it wasn't some lesser buck that took over because this buck was killed and this was the dominant buck. No, this, this was a different buck for sure. So anyway, but I was lucky that morning. I came in here and I heard the ice cracking, moved up a little bit and I got this buck. But this is not an uncommon place, a place like that. Uh, I've known I know some people who hunt down in southern Minnesota on the Mississippi River and, there, and that, there's a lot of islands down there. Some of them are 10 acres, there's some 20 acre islands, some smaller. And the only way you can get to them is by boat. And 
some places that I've hunted, and I'll show you some of those, uh, the only way you could get there, well, you had to go through water. And I remember I used to carry hip boots with me to get to some of these spots. The biggest bear I've ever taken and this big buck were in places where you could only get there with hip boots. Well, the water was frozen here when I moved in here. I would have had to walk through a lot of water to get to where I sat there, but it was frozen though. I could walk on the ice, careful, to get there without breaking ice. You know, or if I felt spongy ice between a step, no, I don't want to step there, I'm going to step over here. And I could make my way there silently to that, where I sat on that log. So it wasn't all luck. But this particular morning, he was breaking ice here, and he got really close, and I finally got a good open shot at him right there. Or a fairly good open shot. <laughs> so, but this is lesson number one. If you aren't going to, if you're reluctant to spend time hunting places like this, now, you, 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 it would be foolish of you to think, Oh, I want to get out there close where I can watch this island. In this elder swamp, there's no way a human could get close to that without being heard while still a safe distance away, and the buck would have went out some other side of that island and be gone. Go deeper into the swamp or whatever. You couldn't get close to that one because it was all surrounded, all, it's just like jungle around it. So uh, anyway, I suppose if I, if it didn't work that day, I could, maybe if I sat every day and got into the swamp a little ways or get close to this little stream or whatever, maybe I would eventually saw them anyway. Because uh, at, in the fall, now during the summer, you can live out there all summer. There's plenty of grass and cover, and even if the cover wasn't so great, uh, nobody would bother them there. Now, even the wolves wouldn't go out there like, until it's all frozen, then they get out there. But at any rate, uh, but you've got to be able to be willing to travel through places you normally wouldn't want to travel. It can be real steep and heavily wooded, it can be rocky, it could be terrible place. Uh, you know, almost as bad. Is a, is a place like this, surrounded by wide open area. Say it was a clear cut a few years ago, and here's a little island out in the middle of clear cut. Boy, some of those have been some of our best spots to take big bucks over the years. Uh, one of my grandsons uh, took his first trophy buck from an island like that out in the middle of a clear cut. They're all open all around it. but. Uh, that's where he got his biggest buck. Got pictures of it. You know, Grandpa, me, <laughs> and his dad, and him uh, down behind this big buck. Uh, he's happy there with his first big trophy buck. And my son John there taking pictures of us there. But you, you've seen that in previous seminars here. So that's lesson number one. Now we'll take a break here now. I'm going to make another map. We'll be back in a few seconds. Well, here's, here's map number two. <laughs> this is a, this, uh, this one's on here. Now, that first hideaway, one of those hideaways of disappearing non-breeding bucks I showed you today is one thing. And in a case like that, it's almost obvious. I mean, once you know, you know, what, you know the area well, you know the topography, that kind of thing. Here's an island out in the middle of an elder swamp. You put the, it doesn't take much to realize big bucks around it on trails going in this one. Uh, that must be one of those hideaways out there in that middle of that swamp. And boy, what a good one that is. But I've found several over the years, hideaways, that didn't make sense. You know, in fact, I didn't recognize them for what they were until I thought about it a little bit. Like, here's one. Now, I shot the second, second biggest buck I've ever taken at this particular 
one. This place was two miles from camp. I mean, way out there. And uh, well, the, we found that John and I were scouting together that year. Well, every year we scout together. And more so now because uh, the old man's getting up there early. Somebody, you know, we don't want him running around all this country all alone out there and something happens to him, then what, you know, and they, they're thinking that way. And I, I appreciate that, so, but sometimes it's kind of a, well, I wish they wouldn't do that. Anyway, we were together, and uh, I had created a trail all, well, went way back through this country and went, got onto this trail, an old logging trail, but, yeah, just, Kevin just reminded me that over here, running parallel to this trail, is was another trail that was heavily marked by Donald Greenbuck with ground scrapes and antler rubs over in this region. This was part of a dominant buck home range over here, square mile home range, one side of it. So this was right on the edge of it, you know. So uh, that makes sense too. So, but that's where he was. This young evergreen forest here, had obliterated this trail in this section of it at, at any rate. It appeared again later down here somewhere and I shot a buck there one year down there and uh, another one over this way. <laughs> but anyway, this clear cut up here it was new then. And there, this old logging trail went up through this way into the clear cut. And we were, thinking, we were thinking, well, you know, this edge here, or close to this clear cut, might be a really good place to hunt. So we were kind of heading in that direction. And we walked up, we've got on the old trail here where you could find see it. And the old trail wasn't like a, you know, a trail, you, you almost wouldn't recognize the trail because it had grass that deep growing on it. Bit, really deep grass all over the thing. Hardly there were a few little trees growing in there, a little bit of brush, you know, it was a little evergreen right there. And we walked up past here and we came to this trail, this cross trail here. And of course we're always, you know, we got eagle eyes for deer signs all the time and we both recognized right away, boy, look at the big tracks on this trail. Especially over in this part here, I remember going up that turning and following that trail a little bit, fresh droppings and droppings an inch long, four inch tracks, you know, the kind of fresh, going both directions. And this is thick as can be, for young evergreens. Yeah, this was an older clear cut. And most of the evergreens in there were eight to ten feet tall and growing close together. And then this area, but gee, you know, if you were, when you're on your trail, you got evergreen branches on both sides of your hand, they're kind of pushing through there, you know. And, but holy cow, a big buck was using this trail a lot. And it almost didn't make sense. And then we went back there, and in the grass in this area, it, it was kind of open here. You see where the lines go? There was, big beds in the grass. And then at the cross trail there, there was a ground scrape about six feet long and about two and a half feet wide. Great big thing. Yeah, and then over on one side of it right here was a fresh antlerum on a tree, a good sized tree, you know, five, four or five inches of impressive and antlerum. And what a beautiful, you know, and, and then I started checking this trail, and yeah, he's been walking on here too, and, and I remember when we were coming around here, there was a bush down here, a, 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 it wasn't, I think it was a young elder, a whole bunch of stems come, and a buck had devoured that with its antlers, just 
smashed it. It was, I remember we were really impressed. Look at that. <laughs> it had really been torn up there. And, uh, but we went on from there because you can have those things blocks apart made by a buck and maybe still not be anywhere close to anything that's important to a buck. But at first, you know, we looked at this and it looked like there was nothing to eat there, no food that we could see. Maybe there was some over here or some over here somewhere. Well, certainly some out here if, he, if the buck went there, but this is the trail that had most of the tracks. I mean, it was so impressive, I couldn't get it out of my mind. And then, you know, bucks don't make ground scrapes normally in their bedding areas. But yet, I found something like that before. I remember one place, in fact, it took me a couple of years. It was on the north end of a big, steep side of hill we call Antler Mountain. One of my sons named it Antler Mountain. He had taken several bucks in that area. But, uh, there was one area like that. Geez, there was, why would a buck spend all this time here? I wonder. Because there were tracks of big bucks all over there in an area. Probably no more than half acre in size, you know. I, my lot, yard is an acre, about half the size of my yard. And you all know, droppings and everything. What's, what's a deer doing here? And what's complicating in this thing, you know? 10, 20, well, 30, 40 years ago, probably up until about 2008, typically, when we went scouting in late October, buck bedding areas had six or more antler rubs, a bunch, cluster of them. That was the first thing you see. We'd be walking through the woods, oh, there's an antler rub way over there. Look at it. Let's go over there. Let's check that out. And you get close. Oh, there's another one. And look at There's some more over there. And there's typically within an area, a small area, half acre, maybe as big as an acre sometimes, we'd find all kinds of antler rubs. Then you start looking around and, oh, geez, here's a deer bed that leaves down flat, you know, or moss or grass, you know tall grass. They loved it laying tall grass. And they're flat and, and you can measure them. Holy cow, this one is, this bed is 52 inches long. That's a nice buck. I mean, we've measured them up to 56 inches in length. Tall, you know, big bucks. But anything like over 50, that's a nice big buck. Half inch drop, three quarter inch is not bad. Uh, it's likely to be a three and a half year old, but you get up there bigger than that, those are big trophy class bucks that making droppings like that. You know, we'll talk about droppings another time, that's another subject, but anyway, we, we find all these things. Well, on this one, there was these signs, a few here, here's one, and that scrape right there in the middle of the, at the cross trail here, but lots of trap on that one. Go over there and there's just more evergreen forest and over here this is mixed timber, big tall trees, aspens and pop well, popples we call them. And uh, it didn't look like there's anything particular to eat over there either. And it makes you wonder, well, that just can't be an important place. But all those cucks, I never I couldn't get them out of my mind. And we went up this way and looked out here and didn't see a lot of deer sign out there and then we came back and by the time I got back there, I told John, I want to hunt here open morning. <laughs> and there was this little evergreen here, six feet tall, and deep grass all around it, you know, grass that deep. And I looked at that and I said, I've taken big bucks from cover like that, just one little evergreen tree, and but plenty of low growing cover all around me, so I'm sitting on my stool, I'm almost invisible there. You know, I'll stick my head way up, but I didn't have to do that there. I could look through the boughs of those evergreen trees at that cross, uh, cross, and I said, that's where I want to be. And then it, that year, opening mind, the breeze was from the south, and that would be a breeze coming down there. And I remember waking up in the morning, and I looked at the smoke coming out of the chimney of our wood stove, and, and then smoke's going north. 
perfect. So I got going early, got down there, it was pitch dark. I remember when I got to this turn, it was a brand new antler rub right about here on a tree about that big around, you know, six inches, fresh. I mean, you could touch it and that was moist. Uh, oh, geez, he, that buck's around here. I'll bet he's around here. And uh, if he's still using that trail, this I was getting pretty excited when I saw that. And I you know, went in there real quietly, got behind my little tree there, and I had flattened the grass out when we were when I decided on using that spot. So I get in there, and quiet, put stool down in my little flat area there, and get down behind the tree. And I remember. Oh, I had to get my prune out. There was some little boughs in the way over, you know, at the level that I would shoot my rifle, and I kind of cleared a little opening through there so I could see real good. And I could put my gun up there and leave it there. I was sitting across two branches. So, boy, no movement if that deer shows up. This is going to be, you know, I was pretty excited. Well, one of the, it was, it, we, the weather forecast this morning, that day, said we were going to have when 20 some miles an hour, maybe 25, well, holy cow, deer, they'll hole up in their bedding areas when the wind gets over 15 miles an hour. It's pretty normal because it gets, it, the woods get so noisy because of all of that wind, even if it's just gusting, they'll do that. Uh, because they can't hear things around them. That, you know, the, the ears give them warning of anything dangerous around them in a 360 degree circle. I said only gives them warning if it through little spaces in the woods where a hunter might pass, you know, a, a safe distance away. And smell only warns them from upwind, but ears are 360. And when they can't hear things moving in their direction very well, they're going to sit down and they're going to lay down the safest place they know in the woods, and that's their bedding areas. That's, where, that's the kind of place they pick for bedding and stay there all day when it's blowing like that. So I knew by 10 o'clock this wouldn't be any good. And it was getting later and I remember there was a little, there was a little red oak tree right over here with dry leaves on, they're all red. You know, they hold their leaves all winter long, those red oaks. And they were starting to clatter, those dried, it was cold, you know, and they, they were clattering together and starting to get a little bit noisy. They, uh, oh man, if he doesn't come pretty soon, I won't see him today. And all of a sudden he stepped right out and stood there at that crossroad. It came from this direction. And my gun was ready, I got up, neck shot, you know, about 100 yards. Pow, down he went. And I got him. <laughs> now, the point of this is, there's going to be places in the woods that you are going to say, there's no reason for a buck to spend a lot of time here. Yet, there's a lot of fresh sun there, off trail, and you're wondering, why would a buck make all the sign, all the tracks and droppings, and occasional beds? Yeah, I mean, it just didn't make sense. This would be where a buck would spend a lot of time. But those deer signs are telling you something different. That buck is spending a lot of time here. And when you find an area where you come to, and if there's nothing else that tells you a buck is spending a lot of time here, then a lot of really fresh tracks and droppings made by a big buck. They have tracks that are more than three and a half inches in length and droppings. Three and a, three quarters or of an inch or longer that are shiny, you know, and clustered. They're almost always clustered. The, the dropping stuck. They're sticky and stuck together, and they come on clumps. Uh, but you find that, and even if you find nothing else, it's a worthwhile place to spend at least one half day of hunting during the hunting season. You know, and you do it carefully, taking all the precautions, come from when downwind or crosswind, depending, you know, downwind in the morning. Because the deer are already moving around. If they're in feeding areas, they're out there long before you get there in the morning, in the dark even. So downwind in the morning, crosswind in the afternoon. So you have to you have to plan for that. 
and maybe you want to spot, well, gee, you can only hunt there if the wind's from the south, or you might say, well, I can hunt there if the wind's from the south on, uh, uh, in the morning, and I can hunt on the crosswind edge of that feeding area in the afternoon, then I'm okay, the same feeding area. Might, you know, give it two shots. But otherwise, sometimes that's all you get. So don't overlook those spots. They are worthy places to hunt when you find something like that. No other reason except, boy, there's a lot of, lot of really fresh sand here made by a big buck. Now, remember this too, you know, uh, when, when, if you got a dominant breeding buck, remember, he's going to be moving a lot. Uh, even before, you know, like a week before breeding begins, he's going to be chasing other bucks out of there. He's going to be, um, uh, maybe earlier in some cases, and, you know, if you got cold weather earlier, uh, or, and uh, he's been checking does, you know, because he knows some are going to be in estrus, you know, in heat soon. But he's going to be moving around a lot. But if, you, if you're thinking, this buck is not moving around a lot. He, I mean, he's here, obviously, almost several days in a row. Why is he staying here? Because he's a lesser buck. And this is, boy, with this really thick evergreen forest right next to here. I mean, he could go in there or run through there and wolves wouldn't be able to keep up to him because they'd be running into all these young trees and they couldn't see him. And, they would give up in a hurry trying to chase them through that. This this area on this side is almost as bad, full of rocks and steep hills and just a mess over there and water down below here. And so a deer is spending a lot of time there for some reason. And so I was thinking at the time, this is one of those lesser books. Uh, a, uh, you know, and this was, in October, late, getting close to breeding when we found this. This is one of those lesser non-breeding bucks, and this is his hideaway. And the only place that was really open is right here on this grassy trail. So it was all thick on both sides, so it was a good place, you know, prior, good cover. He probably liked that one a lot, and he had marked in, in a few places. But he was staying there, obviously, because of all the fresh tracks. I mean, he didn't make all those tracks in one day. He <laughs> was going on here for a while. So he turned out to be a 12-pointer, really a nice buck. You know, he's on the wall in my office or my desk. A beautiful buck, and, uh, but there was a bigger one in this area. and. Uh, the bigger one was the red antlered buck. <laughs> and I got a chance, I had four chances, close chances, not open, easy chances at that one in the following year. But anyway, we keep that in mind. You find a spot with a, a really cluster of really fresh tracks and droppings made by a buck. I don't care what the reason is, he's spending a lot of time there. And that's a really, it could be a dandy spot to hunt. And like I say, I found several of those years. Then after I had this experience here, I sometimes kicked myself for saying, God, man, there, I, there that spot I would mention south of Antler Mountain, and I found like that. And uh, I was just full of sign like that. I said, what? There's no reason for it, so I, I thought that it wasn't a worthwhile, worthwhile spot to hunt. But I bet you anything it would have been, it would have been as good as this, and with the right wind direction and everything, you know. So keep that in mind. And, you know, if, especially if it's right at the edge of this square mile of big down and buck and all these deer and doe, and dual ranges, home ranges in there, and you're in an area where oh, you can walk around here and you hardly see any deer trails anywhere, just maybe one like this. But all this sign there, you can you can almost bet the farm that's a hideaway of a big down of a big 
not a dominant bark, but a, a big non breathing bark. And uh, he's on the wall, you know. That, there's nothing wrong with, with taking bucks like that, you know, but you're going to find them. You get them. You could hunt here all day, over here, up here, and never see this buck. But you got to get close, and you got to be you got to be looking for those signs all the time. And whether it makes sense or not, now more, all the rest of the spots I'm going to show you make more sense why that was a hideaway. But there's some that don't, except the signs are there and they're sure fresh and there's sure a lot of them, the droppings, all the words. A buck is spending a lot of time here. And if he's doing that two weeks, you know, that close to breeding, like that was probably about seven to ten days before, just two days? Two weeks. Two weeks before breeding. Two weeks. That doesn't mean it's going to change. It's a buck that's already been run off. And he's just hiding here. And it's a safe place for him to do it. Okay. Now, maybe you're more confused now, huh? But the point I'm making, you got to watch for... Now, you know, if John and I had never gone there, and we would have just stayed over here, just walking on this one trail that was heavily marked by a dominant breeding buck. We'd have never known that was there. I'll talk to you more about that in the future here, but the point, this point is, now this happened to be on a trail, and we were walking on it, but it was not well used, you know, except for there were sure signs made by a big buck right in this area. But You can't just walk trails normally and find these. Like that one out in the Elder Swamp, you never find that if you stay on deer trails when you're scouting. Or old logging trails, things like that. You're never going to find a place like that. I got a letter at, at home right now that I just received yesterday or the day before from a guy who wanted, it was having trouble finding buck bedding areas. And he wanted some advice about how to find buck bedding areas. They aren't easy. You know, last year, and I mentioned this before, uh, I spent the last two days of the season, you know, we had a bad season, well, it wasn't a good season. It was still fun to be out there and all that. We only got one big buck last year, boy. That's poor time we've had in a long, long time. And we hardly, none of the rest of us saw a big buck last year. Uh, we found tracks, we saw some younger bucks. We had a yearling camping out right next to our main deer camp, right in my big tent, bedding there and feeding during the middle of the day, right next to our big tent. You know, it would have been easy to add him to our meat pole. <laughs> behind camp, but we we didn't have the heart to do it, you know. And we saw, we, the, the bunch of us saw a few other yearling bucks spread over an area, eight square miles in size. So uh, they were there, and we could have loaded up on yearling bucks, I suppose, but we just don't normally do that. And so anyway, because we had so few deer, I was getting worried, and then I started thinking about these non-breeding bucks and being off range, that we wouldn't be seeing them normally too much. Some of them sneak back, you know, while breeding, and we'll catch some of those when they're there when they shouldn't be. And the dominant buck hasn't chased them away again, and we'll get them. But Ed, uh, but normally. Uh, we we don't even think about these other bucks. I remember my first. In my first uh, study here in Aiken County, uh, we hunted those non breeding bucks a lot at these strange places out in swamps and bogs. And we got a lot of lesser, mature bucks hunting that way. But we got to this new spot and we were getting so good at getting down the breeding bucks that we kind of forgot about those other bucks. And so I started thinking about, gee, man, we're missing the boat here when we got tough hunting like we got, we should be concentrating more on those non-breeding bucks that are hiding somewhere. 
So I said, I'm going to go looking for these hideaways. And in two days, I did some really scouting in the southern half of my study on edges, out swamps and bogs, and, uh, and even one big uh, ashlow, I hate ashlows, deep grass and all kinds of water, and these spindly ash trees that bear. And, but uh, I went through some pretty awful stuff in rugged areas looking for deer, for bucks. And in those two days, I found three of them. That's all. Just three. Now, one I can't get off my mind. I, I, we'll talk about that next, and that's going to be the last one for today. So let, let's go to that one right now. Hey guys, uh, here's map number three, and this this will teach you something too, <laughs> something different. Right now it's starting out. The sun's just going to be setting here in about 15, 20 minutes. When that happens, John's backyard is going to become alive with bucks. <laughs> so. This will be the last map for the day, but it's a good lesson map. Here's an old clear cut. I started hunting this clear cut when it was brand new, well, just wide open, full of grasses, red osiers, and sugar maple saplings growing on a stump. And sugar maple saplings are red and red osiers. Those are two most favorite browse plants in our whole hunting area, all the way back, way over there somewhere. That's, those two plants are 85% of the winter diet of our, of our whitetails until they go to their wintering area where they start eating mostly white cedars around the edge of a lake for the winter. That was the wintering area that's about six miles away. Well, anyway, I've been hunting there all this time, and one of the first times we scouted over here, we had no trails or anything, and we created a trail, went up a hill here, and went over to the edge over here, and gee, there were all kinds of deer tracks out there that deer had been feeding in ushers, and we, when we were scouting pre-season, uh, there were no fresh tracks there. But all the red osiers in there, you know, on arrow, only about this tall, and they can get bigger, but the deer keep eating them, so they can't get that big. But all I had ragged white tips on them, you know, from the previous year. They've been heavily browsed. I mean, they were all 
white tips all over the place and the sugar maples too and they have, there's whitetails that eat about foot or two feet of the tops of those those uh, sprouts coming out of, of sugar maple stumps. And they were all chewed off and so holy cow is this a browse area. And our deer turned to eating browse the beginning of the second week in November. Just like this day they're still eating grass and this day now they only want browse. Heck with the grass. We're eating grouse from now on. Whether there's snow on the ground or not, they switch just like that. And every year, same way. The only time it's earlier is if you have deep snow by that time. Then they they can start on grouse earlier because they don't want to dig too deep for grass. And uh, here behind John's house is a kind of a swamp down there behind his house. Still digging in snow for grass, but they're also eating browse. Well, anyway, back here. So I made, and boy, there was deer running all over there. It was so great. It was just a wonderful place. And uh, each year it seemed like there were fewer and fewer, and because of the wolves. And uh, now, every year when a hunter was scouted here, there was a little pocket that went in right here, the edge of the clear cut, and in, in that pocket was deep grass. And every year when we scout there, except last year, we'd find big beds in that deep grass. And there's some puddles of water in there too. And so, gee, here, far, there's a river or a stream uh, east of there, and east in this case would be over here. They have to go a long way to get water there, and if they wanted to go this way, they'd have a long way to get water there. But gee, right here, it was a nice little pocket where they could get water. It's guys kept wet by uh, springs. We have a lot of springs in our honey that produce water where you shouldn't, where there is no water. It's really great. For the deer. So, beds in there, and we measured them and all that, and big tracks and droppings in there. And, and uh, But I never hunted around this clear cut. Now, we eventually made a trail all the way around it, and I've hunted in various places around it. But we've always hunted with the idea we're going to catch deer feeding in this feeding area. And it's hardly, now last year I never hunted at this spot where the X is. There's a, there was a big evergreen that died there, and natural blind about 20 yards back from the edge of the clear cut. And oh, what a good, you know, year after year you could sit there because it was completely natural. Nothing man made there, just natural. And nothing there to make deer change their mind about spending time feeding on browse over here. So we got another spot like that in our in our big deer country, but those are kind of rare. But that that blind taught us that it's not a good idea to put your blind right on the edge. You always do much better, and the stand side will will be productive much longer if it's back in the woods away from the edge. And if it's really natural looking, it doesn't look like anything's different there. And sometimes you can add a few little loose evergreen balls because they fall from trees and you lay them on top of the log so that your head isn't completely exposed when you're sitting back there on a stool. I do that a lot. But at any rate, but over here, not too far to the left of that, is a huge white pine. And... Uh, it's really big. I mean, it's one of the biggest in the country, in the whole area, 10 square, 8 square miles. And because it's alone, I named it Lonesome Pine. And because, and this, that Lonesome Pine became the name of this clear cut. You know, we name everything so we don't have to have trouble trying to explain to people what where things are. So if we say we're hunting up on a the north side of Lonesome Pine, everybody knows this is where we're going right here. Well, 
Last year when I was scouting on the, on the second day I was out, I went down into this area first because I hadn't really scouted this area, this wooded area on this side of it much. Except one year I found a place where deer had been feeding a lot on browse back in here and I just wanted to go through here and see what I found. And without knowing it, I ended up, it was lunchtime, ended up right here, sitting on the log. Now right over here was a nice looking antler of freshly made. The antler was made, well it wasn't made the day before, but it was made within probably a couple of weeks anyway. Completely girdled the bottom of this big spruce tree. Great big one, about that high from top to bottom, bright boy, you could see it way over there, and that caught my eye and it went over there. And then it, the hill sloped down and there was this hill over here, comes up behind me. Well, I just kind of looked a little open down there and I thought, I'm going to go look at that. And so I went down there and I sat down on the log right here. I geez, I'm hungry, thirsty. And uh, so I was sitting there and looking over this way on the log and I kept looking at this huge tree right over here. And I thought, that tree looks darn familiar. So after I ate my sandwich and drank a little water, I said, I'm going to go over there and look at it. I got a hunch about that. It was the lonesome pine. And here was the clear cup. And then I found that this was kind of an open marsh behind here. There was a little water in it, but a lot of grass growing there. And, I, well, you know, this is kind of interesting. And then I found some fresh tracks and droppings in there. And then in the grass right over here in the woods, not out here, I found some beds. And right away, this whole thing here said, what did it say? Where did it say? Oh, well, uh, take this one. This area said hideaway. And you know, you could walk all around it, this zone, except for that antler rub, find no deer signs. All the deer signs were right in this little area right here. And it wasn't the biggest buck. I, I would say he was a three and a half year old. And this was pretty darn good antler rub, but it couldn't be done by a three and a half year old. And that was the only antler rub I found. Now I might mention now, right here, uh, Fifteen years ago, well, between 1960 and about 15 years ago, the number one thing we would find that always directed us to where we, what we wanted to find when we were scouting in the woods was some big, some antelope over there. And you'd say, well, let's go investigate. And if it was a single one along a deer trail, then that was a scrape rock. If it, you know, like a, a well-used deer trail, because big bucks generally make their antler rubs and ground scrapes on well-used deer trails within doe ranges. That's where they make them because they don't want those other bucks in that doe range. You know, this is my doe. I don't want you around here. This antler rub and that ground scrape tell you this is my breeding range and I don't want you other bucks here. This is mine. So anyway, uh, when we, but if we found a bunch of them, we might find six within an area the size of this room or over spread out over a half acre maybe. And then you're thinking, aha, buck bedding area. Because back in the old days, and you'll see pictures of bucks in place with antler rubs all around them. You'll see that coming up right about now. But 
That was typical, a typical first year sign we'd see that tells where Buck Benning areas is. Now, I don't know exactly why that has changed. But in the last decade, maybe 12, 13 years, something like that, we're not seeing many antler rubs and ground scrapes. And at first, I just didn't know why. But we're seeing, I think it has a lot to do with global warming. You know, warmer Octobers and Novembers, we've had a bunch of those lately where we had no snow, it was even hot. Even this year, uh, Dave got his buck, nice, nice eight pointer, on opening morning. But it was so warm that day, and it was predicted to be warm. We were going to be in the 70s. We were in the 70s that day in the afternoon, and the next day was going to be the same thing. He had to get that deer butchered. And that evening, uh, after, uh, after we ate, he and his wife, drove that deer to a place that usually butchered deer in the fall. Turned out they weren't in business anymore. So what he had to do, well the next morning after hunting till about 10 o'clock, he came back to camp and uh, with his son and, and wife and, and, so, and other people. We were back in camp early because it was too damn warm and we knew the deer wouldn't be moving in, in that kind of weather. Uh, because they got winter coats on and they just hate it when it's like that. But anyway, uh, so we butchered the deer and he got it on ice and then, and then uh, the two days later, and then it got cooler and two days later go home, brought it to a place to be cut up. But anyway, and then came back later. <laughs> now, there could be something else, it could be, well, you know, warm falls, was, would, that would explain it. Normally, you know, you know, we're supposed to be making antler rubs and ground scrapes when it finally gets cool enough so they can do that. And when it gets cool enough, like up at our place, if it goes down below the freezing line, there'll be a frenzy of making antler rubs and ground scrapes. Every buck older than yearlings will be making them. But if it's hot like that, they aren't going to do it. So that's one, one good reason why it might not be him. But in our area, deer numbers have been going down, down, down. And then when you get down to like three or four per square mile, there aren't, five, there aren't uh, three to five extra big uh, mature buck or antler bucks in the average dominant buck's home range. There might be only one or two, maybe even none. And Without that competition, you know, if the buck doesn't have competition in his home range or much, except the yearling bucks have to keep chasing them off, uh, they won't make a lot of antler rubs and ground scrapes. I don't know if that's a reason, it, but it's a, it's a possible. Now, our deer numbers now. Now, I've been getting letters from guys like you know, one guy who wrote me one recently who hunts in northern Wisconsin. And their deer numbers are way down too, and the wolf numbers are way up where they hunt, in northern Wisconsin. Well, of course, they've been having warm falls too, but wolves and, and uh, low deer numbers sir, could be the reason. I'm hoping that's the only reason. But I know, you know, geez, if you're in the 50s to 70s in the fall, in October and November, they are, it's just too warm for them to be out doing that. And so we don't get much. We just find very few of those signs. But I remember in the old days, geez, my brother and Bob and I were, you know, we were in high school and college together. But we'd be saying, oh boy, it's cool. You know, here it is, October 13th, something like that. Well, got, they're having uh, frost up north in our deer country tonight. The deer will be out there making rock grips and antler rubs like crazy, and they did. And maybe the next day it would be too warm and they wouldn't do anything then. And then two days later it was cold again and boom, they're right at it again. You could count on it every year. It was, we called that buck sign. That was before the days when we were identifying deer by the size of the tracks and droppings. I didn't know anything about that then, at that time. Antler of ground strip, that was buck sign. Oh man, there's a buck here, a big one, and 
And, and those antler rubs, geez, they'd make them in the same place, the big diamond box, same place over there. And we could put a permanent tree stand right next to one where they always made it, you know, in October. And come and they still hadn't made one there. And then come back opening day and there's a brand new scrape right in the same spot right next to the permanent stand. And we'd shoot the buck when it came back there. And you could count on those things. It isn't that way now. So today more than ever, you've got to be looking for and paying attention to other deer signs. And they can tell you everything you need to know. Well, let's get back to this one. <laughs> now, I'll take this. And now, this little area here is a hideaway. And there was no doubt about it that when I found that one, I was so happy. I thought, oh, I'm going to find these all over the place. But I didn't. But I found that one. And I said, all these years I've been hunting here, and, and we'd pay attention to that. You know, a big buck come along and want to go over there and bed there, you know, like 10 o'clock or something. 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock in wolf country, they go to bed yet earlier. But I've had big bucks go, go right by there. Heading that and that way and got them now. Now, that highway was, I thought, well, gee, that, they're just that. And they like to bend there and that's the bending there and that's it. That's all there is to this. Well, there's a lot, it turned out I never saw it before because I never scouted back here before. And I come up here and I found that place. I was sitting there and I, all I saw was this. And I went over there and right. In this area, when I was going along the edge here, I started finding all these other deer signs, buck signs, buck size tracks and droppings, and 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 some beds. Oh my, here it is. I've been out here all these years and never knew this spot. Probably bucks were using that spot forever. I, I bet every year, I could be sitting here and here's a buck here, and I would, and I wouldn't see him or come. So. Now, you know, we got this trail we made around here, and I said, what a simple thing it would be on opening morning to make a trail coming over here to this high spot. That high spot is about 20 feet higher than down here. It's like being up 20 feet up in a tree there, and lots of heavy cover up there, including lots of air rings that follows right to the ground. I said, oh, I love that spot. I didn't, uh, I didn't take time to pick out a stand site there. That, I'll do that next fall. Johnny will come along with me and we'll set that up. And we'll have a trail going straight out to this. And when I have a south wind early in the, sun, in the hunting scene, I'm going to be sitting there. And a south wind, I can get to that spot. It's all heavy cover up there. Without, but without a deer down there easily knowing it. Be a straight in from the south, real quiet, you know, I get my trail nice and clean and make sure I have plenty of cover between me and this area all the way to the spot that a deer down there wouldn't be able to see me get there. And I'm not going to be putting a tree stand, uh, portable up in the tree. I'm going to just take my stool and put it down in the spot I have spot behind some of those evergreens or between a couple of them and sit down there and then look, start to get light and I said, oh, watch, oh, I'm going to watch this area. I just know that this is a spot where the odds of taking a mature buck that's coming in are going to be excellent. And what I'm kicking myself because all these years, I never knew anything was like that there because I never scouted that. In between this trail and here, I never knew that was in there. But now I do. <laughs> and Lonesome Pine is going to have a resurgence. You know, this is the kind of a spot that could be good for years. As long as you don't go down in there, stay away from there. Don't be walking around there. Don't be putting cameras down there a day after day and putting fresh trail scent all over that place. No, sir. You go there. Two or three weeks before the hunting season, make sure this trail is nice and clean and your spot where you're going to sit is all set to go and you can be hidden all the way to that spot where you're going to sit. 
and then stay out of there. Don't go in there. So, look at here. Here's the thing. I've been in this area for 31 years and never knew about it. And I didn't know about it until I got, I went across this trail to get there, but there's no trails in there. Well, we found a huge bed in deep grass. It's obviously a bed of a mature buck. I'm going to do some quick measurement here. Let's see if I got a root in here. Not right on hand. Well, I got one of these cards. These cards are six inches long. This bit, yes, it starts about there. Well, it's four feet long, easily. That's a big buck. It was probably made by the buck that made those uh, three quarter inch droppings that we found. That's huge. That's a big animal. Uh, right here, well, here's water right next to me. That's typical. They bed near water, not usually so close. Uh, and uh, of course, the area here is full of food for them. That clear cut's got a lot of grass in it in the winter time. And he's got some quick, thick escape areas all around here to run into if a wolf comes along or a hunter wandering around aimlessly. So uh, this looks good. Kind of goes along with those droppings. Darn, you know, you can do a lot of scouting in a year, but it is really hard to find an area. This is about four or five acres with as much buck sign. Doesn't sound look like much buck sign to you, does it? You're used to looking for other things. But we look for beds and droppings and tracks. And that's all you need. So I'm looking forward to hunting this area this fall, probably opening morning. Good luck to you guys. <laughs> Off trail scouting is what is the way you find those kind of places. You know, I'll take, let's say this is an area I'm going to scout today. And, and I'm looking for buck bedding areas. And you think about, it, well, gee, it's really thick cover over here and over here. And because it's really thick, it probably over in here somewhere. Usually they're within 100 yards of water. Now, if you got a beaver pond or you got a little stream going through there, that's the likelihood. The odds are pretty good that it's, it's going to be somewhere close to that water. Well, this in this case, it is right on top of water. This buck, he's got food, he's got one, plenty of grass here, and then browse later, you know, and he can stay right in here and not have to worry. So, but you're looking for, but you got to get off trail. You know what I like to do? I, I like to take, I like to make swings through area. I, forget trails. Like that morning, I got to this spot, and then my next thing was going to be to make a swing. You know, kind of a curved move. Uh, move in that direction kind of like an arc instead of a straight line and make a swing through that there and then when I was going to get up there I was going to make another swing through this area and then later in the day I got up in the edge of another area and said holy cow I've never been here before and this is gorgeous looking deer country so I made another swing got to be dark before I got out of there but the, Making off-trail swings rather than following trails in heavy cover, especially cover, you, you, you think, well, I'm not going to go over there, I'm going to go around that, it's full of water and all that kind of thing. Hey, you need an aerial a satellite map of your area, and gee, you see these little highlands or islands and spruce bogs and swamps. And those islands are very likely to be hideaways of deer during well those are in estrus and well hunting is going on. See, this they use them for hunting as well as hiding from big dominant breeding bucks who are dangerous at that time of the year. 
And these older bucks, they understand that. It's no big problem for them. They don't like it, but they know we'll stay here until we can't smell pheromone anymore or no gunshots anymore, things like that. But, so when you go through an area like that, make swaths instead of straight lines. And you'll cover more area because it's, you know, this straighten that out, it might be most of that distance. And don't depend on using trails, unless you find heavy deer signs, you know, lots of deer signs on a trail. And stop that and investigate that and the area around it. We used to be, we'd see the, we'd see the antlerobs and investigate the area around that. Well, now it's got to be tracks and droppings and you got to be right there on top of them practically before you find them. So you got to be really looking for them. Keep your eyes peeled. You know, with John and I, we, boy, we hardly have to see one. So look at this one. Dad will say, I just walked by it. Big droppings. Dad, you should come here back here and look at these droppings and big shiny one and stuff. Holy cow, this is something to be, something to check out this area. That might be the only reason. We have shot many big bucks in the last 31 years with no more evidence than a one inch shiny dropping or a clump of them somewhere. And that became the reason. It wasn't necessarily drop, well, the dropping got started, but we started looking at the trails and possible stand sites and Gee, there's big feeding area over here, a lot of Aussies over here, or, or maybe it's a bedding area and look for beds. Oh yeah, here's some beds. Sometimes they're just flattened leaves, but it's a deer bed. And flattened leaves means a deer just left there. Probably when you're coming this way, he got out of there. Because you can come back in a couple hours later and those leaves aren't flat anymore. They're starting to pop up and you don't see a bed there or something. But you got, that's the kind of stuff you got to be looking for. Signs of big bucks are not necessarily antler rubs and ground scrapes nowadays. Now you got to go with tracks and droppings to start with. But then when you find them, you got to investigate the area. And if all of a sudden he starts finding these other signs and then you're looking for a stand site like right there, that's what you do when you're hunting for big buck, especially these non-breeding bucks that are off range, places you've never been, or they're out past the area that, of this square mile. You know this square mile is a down a buck range. And, but you get out past the edge of it, and you get into that area, and, and the reason you, you never go there because, geez, that's a mess there. You know, I don't even want to hunt there. Well, you got to be thinking differently when you're having a problem finding bucks to hunt, the older bucks, then you kind of start being serious about checking those places where you normally don't want to go. And that's when you start finding these things. So sometimes, now we'll talk about it, sometimes you don't find them until you get across some water somewhere. You know, we can get over there and I got one and wait, my son John is going to be really excited about this. <laughs> wait till I tell him a place we've never hunted before that is almost guaranteed we're going to find some decent bucks there. And it isn't that big an area. I mean, well, it's a square mile for sure. But wait till I take them to that spot next year. You, I am not going to tell them what it is, but it's going to be, well, it's going to be one day of scouting all by itself, just that one, one area. And there's going to be trouble because we got to cross water to get to it. He's going to have to, he and I are both going to buy some new hip boots before we scout next year because that's going to be one of the first places we're going to go. Because I think it's going to be really worthwhile. His brothers, nobody's been there. And uh, it's time we investigate that spot. But anyway, enough for today, guys. I've got four more all different spots that non breeding bucks use when they're chased off range by dominant breeding bucks and they're also used during hunting seasons but even by dominant bucks that are, you jumped and they ran off range and they didn't come back if they're likely to be temporary uh, 
abodes, hideaways of even the biggest bucks in the area. So finding them is a good idea. Now normally, you know many years ago I used to specialize back in Acre specialize in hunting buck bedding areas. After breeding, after the 17th of November, I went to the buck bedding area in the square mile that that buck bedded on. That's the safest place the buck knew. And after breeding him, boy, he'd go back there and he'd, that was a pretty worn out buck by that time. And he'd spend the whole week there without hardly moving. And sometimes he had another buck with him, a younger one, to act as a sentinel while he rested. And then when he'd start feeding again, it usually would be in the path of the nearest doe with a fawn or two, they follow her tracks because they're they use other deer like that all the time, like radar to us to to uh, stay away from danger. So I'd be hunting where you know the nearest doe was feeding, or within sight of that bedding area. And I boy, I used to get bucks that way, but I also learned if I didn't, if that buck found me. And a lot of times it was without my knowledge. I just ruined this, the 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 safety of the safest place it knows. It would be like a burglar comes in your house, and all of a sudden your house doesn't seem so secure anymore. They'll abandon not only abandon the bedding area, but the whole their whole home range as well, and you won't see them the rest of the year. So we used to, we used to finally we learned. Geez, don't hunt buck bedding areas till the end of the season. We want them to stay in their ranges so they have chances to, shoot, to find them, or to, to take them elsewhere within the range, like bedding areas and feeding areas of doors. That's, but anyway, uh, so we kind of left them alone and we liked to find them so we could stay away from them so the bucks would stay there. But anyway, uh, but so that's why it's a good idea to find them anyway so you don't ruin that. But we'll talk more about that next time. Well, with that, I better quit here, you guys. And uh, sun's getting down. And I gotta get home. Bucks are gonna be all over this backyard pretty quick, and they come here to feed. One thing I have to do here at the end, I have to make a living. <laughs> Don't forget to get your bucks here. Uh, this tenth edition of Whitetail Hunters of Almanac of mine. Now there's some guys. There's one guy at least that uh, writes books called White Tail Hunters Almanac. If my name isn't on the book, it's not mine. So don't be fooled by that. So if it's not on the book, <laughs> that's not my book. So uh, keep that in mind too. But uh, you're learning more and more each time you watch one of my seminars why you need to have this book. And it's going to help you to be a buck hunter for the rest of your life. I know. I mean, there's no more. What you know, all these things. What are those bucks going to do? And they're not going to go to the next county and live there instead because of you. They'll stay there as long as you do it properly, and as long as you're a skilled stand hunter. Those bucks will be there year after year unless the wolves eat them. And so, and there's no way they can adapt to the kind of hunting you're learning. Uh, they can adapt to a guy that sits in the same tree. They do it all the time, every year. You sit in the same tree the whole season. They adapt to that. But you're not going to do that. But anyway, get your book <laughs> soon. With the, and I'm also uh, subscribe to, to my, my YouTube channel. And then poke that thumbs up button if you if you like what you heard today, and I can't imagine you haven't, just take the time to do that thing. And, I, and thanks for doing that, you guys. Really, it means a lot to me. So, with that, uh, uh, thanks for coming, and I'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my ebooks. My son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries. My website bookstore and much more.